thank you all for coming back. And we'll look at now the third topic, the mark of the beast. And before we do, we'll invite you to bow your heads and we'll invite God's blessing. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we want to thank you for what you've revealed in your word. Lord, we've seen your dealings in the past, your great mercy and watch care. And Lord, we know that you've shared these things in your scriptures to tell us what's coming. We know that nothing takes you by surprise. So as we study through what you've revealed to us, we pray you'll be with us. Help us to clearly understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The mark of the beast, what is it? An interesting topic. Now, the, we've been looking at the two beasts in chapter 13 of Revelation. You've got the beast from the sea, and you've got the beast from the land. And the beast from the land comes up, it says it had two horns like a lamb. And we think, what's scary about a lamb? Well, nothing really. This beast that came up out of the earth, and we saw that a beast can also be a nation. And we saw that this fits the United States perfectly in prophecy. And where it goes is the worrying thing. It says he spake as a dragon. And it says he causes all to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And in chapter 14, the following chapter, there's a warning from heaven. It says, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So people have read chapter 13 and 14 and thought, well, something's going to be in the hand or in the forehead. What could that be? Is it? an implanted chip. This is a popular thought today. The mark of the beast. <clears throat> Thou shalt not get chipped, it says. So could this be an RFID chip that can be read remotely? And this is a very popular theory today. But you know, as with any Bible passage, you must let the Bible explain its own terms. When the Bible says, and the forehead or on the hand, what does the Bible mean by that phrase? We can think in our minds what it might be. But let's go to the scriptures themselves. And we're going to go back to the Passover. So many wonderful lessons we find from the Passover story. When Moses confronted Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh refused. And so God sent the plagues to show Pharaoh who was in control. And finally, the last play, God warned that the firstborn in Egypt would be slain, except where blood was placed on the doorposts, saved through the blood of the Lamb. And when the, the death angel, shall we say, came through at midnight, it says, At midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And so this was enough. Finally, the Egyptians said, Go. It says, The Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We all be dead men. And so the Israelites left. It says, It came to pass that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. This was the birth, if you like, of the Israelite nation. No longer were they slaves, just a tribe of slaves in Egypt. Now they were a free people, a way to determine their own destiny, being led by God. This was such a momentous event that God wanted them to remember this for all their generations. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. This was the reminder of the Passover, to remind them how God brought them out of Egypt. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me, and came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be 
hand and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Therefore shalt thou keep this ordinance in a season from year to year. God wanted them to remember the Passover, the birth of their nation. Notice particularly verse 9. This Passover memorial, it was to be a what? It says in verse 9, It shall be a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes. Does that sound familiar? What have you just been reading about the mark of the beast? Where was it to be received, the hand or the forehead? But what does the Bible mean by that phrase, the hand and the forehead? Here's the first clue. There's a law of first mention in the Bible. The Passover was to be in their hand and in their forehead. Was the Passover an RFID chip? No. Exactly. Let's keep going. This is very important. And it shall be, when thy son asketh thee in time to come, What is this? That thou shalt send him by strength of the hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. And verse 15 describes that Passover. For when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of the beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And here it is again. It shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes. In other words, the forehead. For by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. That was before they crossed the Red Sea. God was instilling this memorial for them. They went through the Red Sea. They come to Mount Sinai. And here God formed a covenant with this people, gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And right in the heart of those commandments was the reminder to keep God's Sabbath day holy. And he reminds them why. Because God made in six days the heaven and the earth. And God wrote this with his own finger. And these tables of stone were kept in the most holy place, in the most sacred piece of furniture inside the most holy place of the tabernacle, God's law. Now, as they were coming into the promised land, Moses reminds them of their journey. Here they are in, in the wilderness, and it says, These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness. And he reminds them the amazing experience they've had as a people. He said, Did ever people hear the voice of God? speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard, and live? Or hath God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? He's reminding them what an amazing experience they've had, having the God of the universe take this people, this tribe of Israelites, out of another nation and make them his special people. And he says, These words which I command you this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon where? Thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Wow. So he's reminding them, where do you, what were they to do? Remember these words, have them in your heart, and it will be a sign on your hand and between your eyes. And you keep reading on in chapter 11, the same things. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul. Bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. So that's a biblical expression to say, remember, remember and do, hand and forehead. Very simple. Now the Israelites tended to take things literally. I'm sure you remember when Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews, then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his what? His body. He wasn't talking about the literal building that we call Herod's temple, the second temple. He was talking about himself, his body. But how did they take it? They took it very literally. Another example was Nicodemus. Remember Jesus met Nicodemus at night? There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now how did Nicodemus take that? Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? What was Jesus talking about? <laughs> Very much a, f a spiritual rebirth, wasn't it? How was Nicodemus taking it? How can I climb back into my mother's womb and be born again? And they tended to take things quite literally, didn't they? Jesus had this to say about the Jews. He said, all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. What are these phylacteries? We'll have a look at those in a second. Back in Deuteronomy, Moses had reminded them about these commandments. In verse 8, Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. How was that taken? Very literally. And the phylacteries were what they used to wear. The little boxes the Jews put on the front there. And you can see the strap on an arm, binding it on their hand. They took Moses' words literally. And when Jesus said, you enlarge your phylacteries, they used to make big boxes to say, look, see, I'm following what Moses said. I'm binding the law on my forehead. And if you open up those little phylacteries, you'll find inside they've got all the little scrolls, the word of God, you see. They took it extremely literally. Is that what God meant? No. <laughs> God wasn't talking about tying little boxes to your head or straps on your arm, was he? But that's how they took it, very literally. And even today, you can go to Israel and you'll see the, the very devout Jews have these phylacteries. And that's what Jesus was talking about. They do all their works to be seen. It was external. It was meant to be an inward thing. Also, he said, and they enlarged the borders of their garments. Now, what was that talking about? You know, there's a time when there's a woman having an issue of blood 12 years. It said she'd spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood staunched. Why did she want to touch the border of his garment? <laughs> exactly, you're right. God had told them something, something on their clothes to keep reminding them. And find it here in Numbers. This is the instruction to Israel. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. And that they put upon the fringe of the borders a riband of blue. They'd put a blue border around the, the hem of their garments. And what was the purpose of this? It was a reminder. You see the next verse. It shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them, that ye seek not after your own heart and after your own eyes, after which ye used to go whoring. Remember That ye may remember to do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. So they'd put a blue border around the bottom of the garments, and God was saying, look at that, and remember to do all of the commandments. And when they didn't, they would go a whoring, it says. What does it mean to go a whoring? Well, should we say spiritual prostitution, unfaithfulness? Now, in the temple system, the sanctuary system that God gave them, we see the colours that were used in the temple system. You had blue, purple, and scarlet, and gold. For example, the priest had a, a headband made of gold. He had a blue outer garment. When we talk about a whoring, you know the Bible mentions a great whore in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 17, you might be familiar with the great whore, the mother of harlots. And it describes the colors that this harlot woman is wearing. It's in Revelation 17.4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour and decked with gold and precious stones. Now those are the colours of the sanctuary. The high priest would wear purple and scarlet and he had a gold band on. He had precious stones on his vest. But there's a, one of the colours is missing. The blue. You're right. The blue doesn't mention blue. What was the blue to remind 
the Israelites of to keep all, all of the commandments, all of them. And if they didn't keep all of them, they'd go a whoring. Now, here's the whore. She's missing the blue. And what are the colors of this church system? Purple and scarlet and lots of gold. But it's, the blue's not there. And this woman in Revelation, it says, on her name was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the, of the earth. Who is this? What is this? Well, the reformers identified this as, again, the Roman papacy, another symbol for the same power as the little horn and the first beast in Revelation 13. They say, here it is in Revelation 17. So is the Roman system a mother? She calls herself a mother. If you go to Rome, you'll see this is the Archbilica of St. John in Lateran. This is the church that the Bishop of Rome is the pastor of. This, in some ways, is the most important church in Rome. Not the St. Peter's Basilica and the Vatican, but this one here. And you can look this up. This is public knowledge. This is on Wikipedia. As the Cathedral of the Pope, i.e. the Bishop of Rome, this is the Bishop of Rome's home church in Rome, it ranks superior to all other churches of the Roman Catholic Church, including St. Peter's Basilica. And therefore, it alone is titled to Arch Basilica, among all other basilicas. So this is a very important building in Rome. And in fact, Pope Pius XI, in 1929, when he was commemorating his 50 years in the priesthood, issued this coin. And on the front of the coin, it had St. Peter's Basilica and also the Arch Basilica, St. John in Lateran. Now, if you go to the Arch Basilica, at the base of the, the columns, you'll see this inscription in Latin. And here's the translation. Here's the, the Latin. And the English translation says, Holy Lateran Church, mother and head of all churches in the city and in the world. So this is the mother church. And in fact, if you go to the Vatican website, you can see here they say, the church is the mother. It says, mother and teacher, article number three. And it says, the church in her motherly care grants for us the mercy of God. So the Roman church calls herself a mother. And here in Revelation 17, it calls it the mother of harlots. Now, what was God's sign, the sign that God gave to be the sign between himself and his people? Let's have a look at what God says. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths shall ye keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So from God's point of view, what was the sign that he identified, that he said, this is to be the sign between me and you? The Sabbath day. And we find this in Ezekiel as well. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths, my Sabbaths, this is God's Sabbath, to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that does sanctify them. Now when Jesus came, did he come to bring in a new sign, a different sign, something different? Was he going to change things? Well, what was Jesus' practice? What was his custom regarding the Sabbath? As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up for to read. So Jesus' custom was to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And one time he was disputing with some Pharisees. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. He called himself Lord of that Sabbath. And why would that be so? Was he not the creator God? We find in the Bible Jesus was the one who spoke this world into existence. He was the one that created in six days. He was the one that rested the seventh day, and therefore blessed and hallowed that day. So he is the Lord of the Sabbath because he created it. And this is emphasized in three of the Gospels. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And Mark it says, therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And Luke it says, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So which is the Lord's day? It's the Sabbath day. Exactly. Was it to be kept 
after the crucifixion and his resurrection? Well, back in AD 31, just before he was crucified, he told his disciples about the destruction that was coming on Jerusalem, which would be about 40 years later. And he gave them the sign to look for, to flee, to escape that destruction. And he said, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So were the Sabbath still being kept 40 years later? It was in AD 66 when that destruction came. In fact, even in death, Jesus kept the Sabbath. He was placed in the tomb. And it says, The women also which came with him from Galilee rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. This is the day after the crucifixion. Then the resurrection morning, Jesus came out. So Jesus crucified on a Friday, rested in the tomb on Saturday, and rose on Sunday. And there's a wonderful parallel there. Jesus, when he had created the world in six days, rested after his work of creation, and made that day hallowed and blessed. Now, on earth, after his work of redemption, dying on the cross, he then rested again on the Sabbath day, and then he rose again on Sunday. So he rested after his work of creation, he rested after his work of redemption. And when we come to the book of Revelation, and it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, logically, biblically speaking, what day could that be other than the day that Jesus is Lord of? Now, it's true that today people use that expression from the Scriptures and apply it to a different day, but the original intent of that was the Lord's Day. The Sabbath of the Creator God in Genesis is the Lord's Day in Revelation. And you might say, well, but it's changed. It was changed when Jesus died on the cross. Does God change like that? He says this, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. When God blessed the seventh day back at creation, did he then later change his mind and alter that blessing and put it on a different day? Is there any record of that? No, it's forever, it says. Nothing can be changed. When God does something, it's perfect, it's good, there's no need to change it. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. Would he change the day that he blessed at creation? Take away the blessing and put it on a different day? No, not at all. He says, my covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. When God spoke audibly to all the Hebrews at Mount Sinai, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall the labor and do all their work. He says, I'm never going to alter that. All his precepts are sure they stand fast forever and ever. When God blesses a day, there is no removal of that blessing. God doesn't remove it, and how can a human being do that? So then how did the Sabbath get changed? How is it that the, the day which God blessed and which his people, the Jews, back in that time kept, how could that have changed to a different day? Well, Paul explains, he talked about there would come a falling away and the man of sin be revealed, a falling away from the truth of God. And during the Dark Ages, traditions came in, unscriptural things like penances, indulgences, worship of images, a corrupt church hierarchy, human dogmas came in. And that little horn power that Daniel had been instructed about in prophecy it says it would think to change times and laws. Here's the whole passage. He, that's the little horn, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. This is the battle of the little horn against God. He spoke words against God. He persecuted the people of God, the saints of God, and he thought to change the times and laws of God. You might say, it doesn't say change times and laws of God. It doesn't say that in the text. But you know, it would not be an identifying mark of any earthly power because every government changes laws. 
this power would think it could change God's laws. In fact, here's where we find that. This is a quote from a Catholic source. It says, The Pope has power to change times and abrogate laws. There's the changing the times and the laws. And even dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That power believed, they believe, it thinks to change times and laws. It believes it has the power to change even that which Jesus himself has established. And we find that on the left-hand side is the commandments as God spoke them audibly in the audience of a couple of million people and is recorded in the Bible. On the right-hand side is the version you'll find in catechisms issued by the Catholic Church say this is the Ten Commandments. And conspicuous by its absence is number two about bowing down to graven images. That's been removed. And to keep ten because it sounded a bit funny to say nine commandments, they split number ten into two different ones, not to cover your neighbour's wife or to cover his goods. And again, this is no secret. If you go to the Vatican website, and it lists here the ten commandments on the left, as found in the Bible, and then you'll find on the right there a traditional catechism formula. And there's a big gap there. Can you see there's a large gap on the right-hand side? Something's missing. It's the second commandment found in the Bible. And they acknowledge it's in the scriptures there. And they've removed it. But you see, they don't have a problem with this because they believe the Pope has power to change God's law. So no problem. Yeah, God says that, but we've changed it. And in fact, this is even on coins. This is a, a, a coin from Vatican City a friend of mine got. You can see the reverse side has Pope Paul II. It's a 200 lira coin. And if you look closely at the Ten Commandments there, you'll see something. There's the commandments, and it says man on the left and data on the right. Man data, meaning mandatory. These are, you know, to be obeyed. But there's two tables there. You remember the tables of stone. Four of the commandments was our, our honour and duty to God. Don't have any other gods. Don't bow down to images. Don't take his name in vain and keep his Sabbath day. And the other six is our duty to our fellow man. But they've, the Catholic Church has removed the one about images, so that leaves only three for God. And they split the tenth one into two, so now there's seven of those. And can you see they've got one, two, three on the left for our duty to God, and four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten on the right is our duty to our fellow man. But in God's version, what should it be? It should be four on the left, and six on the right. Do you see that? So they acknowledge here on their own coins that we've altered God's law. We've removed one of their commandments to honour and obey God. And we've split one of them on the right-hand side. The Catholic Encyclopedia says the church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's Day. Well, a couple of points here. First of all, it wasn't a Jewish Sabbath. Yes, the Jews kept it. As the people of God then, they kept God's Sabbath. But the commandment says, remember, the Sabbath. Whose Sabbath was it? It was God's Sabbath, exactly. God in the Bible calls it my holy day. It's not a Jewish Sabbath. It predated any Jew. It was created at Eden. And even before they came to Mount Sinai, God says, remember the test of the manna, Exodus chapter 16? He says, how long refuse they to keep my laws and how am my Sabbath? And it's not the third commandment anyway, it's the fourth one. Here's a catechism which shows us, they ask the questions here. I'm not sure if you can read that, but it says, what is the third commandment? The third commandment is, Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Quite plain, very obvious. They don't have any bones that we were the one that changed the day. Here's an interesting magazine produced by the Catholic Church. 
And it says quite plainly here, Protestants who accept the Bible as the only rule of faith and religion should by all means go back to the observance of the Sabbath. The fact they do not, but on the contrary observe Sunday, stultifies them in the eyes of every thinking man. It says we Catholics do not accept the Bible as the only rule of faith. And they go on to say we believe the church has as much authority basically. And they say, they acknowledge down the bottom, it's always laughable to see the Protestant churches and pulpit and legislation demand the observance of Sunday of which there's nothing in their Bible. They say that. Sunday is founded not on scripture but on tradition and it is distinctly a Catholic institution. Another magazine said Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of scripture there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. She, talking about the Catholic Church, substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Now, during the Dark Ages, when the Reformation came along, the Reformation wanted to point people back to the scriptures. Martin Luther discovered that text that says, the just shall live by faith, not by works. And the Protestant Reformation was going back to the scriptures, back to the Bible they found. And they said, we need to stand on the word of God. And when they came up against opposition, they would say, we're only keeping, we want to follow what the early church did. What did Jesus and his disciples do? Anything added to that would be an unbiblical tradition. In fact, the church, the church that they knew, the Catholic church, the state religion of the time, they said has departed so much from the scriptures, it's almost unrecognisable. And this led to the Council of Trent. How do we respond to the Protestants? They say we've departed from the scriptures. How do we respond to this? Now there's an interesting book called Canon and Tradition. And here's what came out of that council. It said the council Trent fully agreed with Ambrosius Pelagius that under no condition should the Protestants be allowed to triumph by saying that the council had condemned the doctrine of the ancient church. Because the Protestants were saying if you condemn what we're teaching, you would condemn Jesus and the disciples. We're only teaching the same thing. It's come straight out of the scriptures. You condemn us, you would condemn the early church. And they're struggling. How do we answer this? How can we respond to this accusation? It says, this practice called untold difficulty without being able to guarantee certainty. Finally, at the last opening on the 18th of January, 1562, all hesitation was set aside. The Archbishop of Reggio made a speech in which he openly declared that tradition stood above scripture. There's your solution. If we say tradition is a higher authority than the Bible, we've solved it. But how are they going to sell that to the people? How can you say traditions are higher authority than scriptures? And they had an answer, and it's in the next paragraph. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures. Why? Because the church had changed Sabbath into Sunday, not by command of Christ, but by its own authority. And of course, what day was everybody keeping? Sunday. And that was their argument. They say, look, tradition is higher authority than scriptures because everybody keeps Sunday because we said so, even though the scriptures teach something different. And that was their killer argument. We have to decide ourselves, what are we going to use? What is our basis? What is our authority in our lives as Christians? Is it tradition or is it the word of God? This is a big test that we all need to answer. So let's get back to the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? I guess you start with the question, who is the beast? What system, what power, what church is the beast? And we know who it is, it's been identified as the Roman Catholic system. So what does the Roman Catholic Church claim as its sign or its mark of authority? The fact that they could change the day, that shows it exactly. 
And here we are. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. What a, what a sign of their power and authority if everybody in the world does what they say. They say keep Sunday and the world does it. They say that's, that's our mark or sign of our power and authority. How can you prove that the church has power to command feasts and holy days? By the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of. And therefore they fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most other feasts commanded by the same church. Question, have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals or precept? Answer, had she not had such power, she could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first other week, for the observance of Saturday, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. And here's an interesting quote from Cardinal Gibbons. He says, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change, that is from Saturday to Sunday, was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. And this Catholic magazine, which actually has been removed, expunged, I think had too much attention drawn to it, but it's on record, photographic record, it says, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. They must have been embarrassing, because if you try to find that magazine anymore, it's, it's gone. But since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course, it is inconsistent, but the change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. They have continued to observe custom, even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. That observance remains the reminder of the mother church from which the non-Catholic sex broke away, like a boy running away from his mother, but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. Interesting analogy there. So does anybody have the mark of the beast now? Well, the mark of Rome's authority is Sunday observance, but... It's when these two powers get together and enforce it that it is called the mark of the beast, as enforced in Revelation 13. That beast that comes up out of the earth, it had two horns like a lamb, and it's going to speak as a dragon, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And here it is, he causes all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now what have we seen from scripture that it means when you have a mark in your right hand or in your foreheads? The Passover was to be in their hand and in their foreheads. It was a memorial day. The Passover was a memorial day, and God says, put it in your hand and in your forehead. So when the beast power enforces its mark of authority in the right hand and their foreheads, what does it mean? Does it mean an RFID chip? No, it's talking about compelling by force the world to observe what it says as the proof that I have authority to change God's law. And there's going to be an economic boycott for those who don't receive the mark. And God's warning is, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, through every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying, Fear God and give glory to him, if the hour of his judgment has come. And worship, now notice that, here's the issue here, worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water, and if you look at the third angel's message, another th third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, he himself 
shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So what's the issue here, according to Revelation 14? It's about worship. Do you see that? You either worship the creator God, acknowledge him, or you acknowledge the beast power as the authority that you're following. The issue is worship. It's not about a chip put under the skin. The biblical meaning of that phrase, hand and forehead, is about observing worship like the Passover, etc. That's what the issue is. And God is going to have a people that will, despite all the pressures, will keep God's commandments as he wrote them, not as it's been changed by the Catholic Church. Here is the patience of the saints, like the patience of Job. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We either worship the Creator or we worship the beast. The question is, what is our guide? Is it the Bible or is it tradition? Choose this day. Are you going to follow God's word, the scriptures, or are you going to follow a tradition, a man-made tradition of the Catholic Church? Because the real issue is not about a day. It's about who is the authority. Who's, who's the one that you follow in your life? Who are you worshipping? Who, who are you following? Who's central in your life? Is it God or is it a human being? Who has the authority to define sin? God or man? This system believes that Peter was ordained by Jesus to be the first pope and that they're in succession. Let's see what the first pope actually said then. <laughs> Peter and the other apostles answered, said, we ought to obey who? God rather than men. Peter, the first pope, if you like, said, obey God rather than men. Because the issue is this. This is what brings it home. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. That's the issue. It's not about a day, it's about Will you follow God? And if God says, remember the Sabbath day, the day that I blessed, we say, yes, Lord, okay. If a man comes along and says, no, no, I've got the power to change what God says, keep Sunday, are you going to accept that? If you do, you're effectively saying, I accept you as my highest authority, not God. Daniel 3, remember the three worthies? They were commanded to bow down, break God's commandments, worship an image, and they stood true. And God honoured that. Daniel chapter 6. Remember Daniel was told not to pray to any other God for that period of time and he was faithful to God. He got thrown in a den of lions but God saved him out of it. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. In fact, it goes on to say this in First John. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments as a liar, and the truth is not in him. God's Sabbath was given at creation. It was repeated at Sinai. It's been kept by his people then. It was kept by Jesus, honoured by the disciples. It's the sign of God's creative power. And it's going to be kept in the new earth. The Sabbath will be kept in heaven, in the new earth. So the issue is, who are we going to worship, the creator or the beast? It comes down to this, who is number one in your life? Are you going to follow God and what he says? Or will you follow a tradition of a man, a man who believes he can change what God said? And if you accept that, that's acknowledging his power. That's why they call it, it's our mark of authority. Do you want to follow Jesus all the way? If you want to follow Christ all the way, then we'll keep the day that he blessed, that he sanctified, that he kept when he was on earth, and then we're going to keep with him in the new Jerusalem. Thank you. Let's close with a prayer, shall we? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to follow you all the way. Again, we submit our lives to you and say, Lord, polish us up, use us in your service, and help us to be fitted up for that wonderful eternal life to spend with you in bliss in heaven. Lord, in following you all the way, we want to keep your Sabbath day holy. Lord, help us to put behind us any man-made tradition that has no basis in Scripture. But may we be faithful to you in what you want us to do. 
So Lord, we submit, sur- sorry, surrender ourselves to you and submit to you totally. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.